Okay. okay. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> I wish I was there in person, but it's very nice to even think about talking to people from Chicago and Illinois. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk um, about our project, um, half of which was done in Chicago, um, where we have followed a group of people with autism and also some other neurodevelopmental disorders from the time they were two up until the time that they were 30. Um, I do need to say right at the start that I do get royalties from the diagnostic instruments if I if, they're, if they have any relationship to things that I'm involved in or other related projects, the royalties are donated to Half Dreams, which I know many of you are familiar with. And also some of the other royalties just go straight to Half Dreams, which has been a great thing to be part of. Um, I also am involved in consulting to a variety of different agencies, um, which you should know. Um, I have funding from a number of different sources, none of which are responsible for what I'm saying. It's just me. Um, so I wanted to start, and let me just make this smaller so I don't, with the idea that autism is a neurobiological disorder that affects how people learn and process. And that means that it changes with time, and it also affects development in turn, which can both mean that things can get a lot better, or also sometimes things can get worse if people with autism don't have opportunities to learn. And I think one of the things that I have become more and more aware of from it doing our study is that things change and there are possibilities of change um, really at any point in development. Also, I think an important aspect of autism, which I think everybody here knows, is that autism se seldom occurs by itself. Having autism makes people more at risk for other things such as social anxiety, depression as an adult. Many, but not most of people with autism also have intellectual disabilities. Many people have language disorders. And there are also a variety of physical problems that sometimes people have um, who have autism. I think it's important to recognize that nobody has all of these, um, but that most people, and, and the reality is most people without autism have some kind of other problem. And sometimes those other problems are more significant even than the autism. I also think as we talk about autism as a disorder of learning and processing, we want to remember that one of the difficulties in autism is that people with autism have trouble with basic aspects of social behavior, eye contact, vocalization, facial expressions, gestures, and sometimes paying attention to the things that other people would attend to. Now that doesn't mean that they aren't paying attention to something perfectly worthwhile, but it makes learning to be an ordinary adult more difficult. Um, but we can change this. And I have this slide from a family that actually I first met in Chicago. The girl on the right has autism. She was blessed to be from a family of three other girls and amazing parents. And even though she had really quite significant autism, they just brought her into everything that they did, not just throwing her in, but practicing and rehearsing. And I still remember when her mother was getting restaurant, um, getting the, the uh, things to order from a restaurant, laminating them, practicing it with her, and then going to the restaurant. And here they've got her in a life jacket, which for a girl with sensory um, issues was not a mean project and she's happy and she's doing things with her sister. And that's the point of what we want to do. We want to make sure, first of all, we may have to adapt things somewhat. But we want to make sure that people with autism have all the opportunities to learn that they can. So why would we try and follow a group of people for such a long time? Why are developmental pathways and trajectories important? And one thing is to predict what's ahead. We cannot predict on an individual basis what's going to happen to any child 100%. But we can have a better idea of what happens to most kids. Um, we can also do a better job then of selecting goals for intervention. If we know that things like, for example, flapping your hands 
often decrease as kids get older. Maybe we don't need to spend so much time getting kids to stop doing it if it's not interfering with anything when they're young and focus on something. If we know that language changes, the major language changes almost always happen early, we can focus on that. And again, knowing not only what do we wanna focus on, but when. We also would like to understand better relationships between features of ASD, the neuro and the neurobiology, but that's farther away. So our first question in this longitudinal study, which just means that we saw the same people over time, was can we diagnose autism in two-year-olds? When we started this study about 32 years ago, we really weren't sure. A lot of people thought you had to wait until kids were four or five. And we thought we probably could, but we weren't certain. So we decided to have multiple measures, which meant that we directly saw the children. We using a precursor to the toddler ADAS. We interviewed the parents using a toddler version of the ADI, a long interview. We also tested the kids with Baileys and Mullins and various tests. Um, and we were able to do this with 192 consecutive referrals. So we were able to actually see everybody that was referred to one of five TEACH clinics in North Carolina under age three. And then also a similar size sample, about half the sample from the University of Chicago. Um, we also had 21 kids who came to us from the people that referred the first groups of kids, but where they didn't have any evidence of autism when we met them at two. And we've added about 50, we call them new recruits, but we've now known them for almost 15 years, who we met in Michigan who had early diagnoses and were the same age as our sample. Now, this is just a simple representation of this sample. And one of the things that's important to know is that, you know, think about it, 30, 32 years ago, who were bringing their kids to an autism clinic at age two. These were very brave parents. And I do think they are, they're not particularly wealthy, not particularly well-educated, but, but, but they were brave saying, wait a minute, I don't know what's going on with this child. And if someone raised the possibility of autism, I'm gonna find this out. Many families would not have done that. They also, more of our sample have intellectual disabilities than in a clinic today who saw consecutive two-year-olds. And that's partly because that's how autism was construed. Um, so in this sample, about 57% about of the people now knowing them as adults have autism and also intellectual disabilities, meaning that they have IQs below 70 and they are delayed in all of their skills as well as having autism. But what's been interesting is also that of the people that didn't have intellectual disabilities, we have a significant, not huge proportion of people who really don't look autistic at all anymore. We also have a significant number of people and that's the no ASD. Technically these people could still say they have autism because they always when, if, once you get a diagnosis, if you need to use it, you can use it again, even if you don't obviously meet criteria. But there also are, is a group. So about 27% of the people with average IQs have really moved out of autism as far as we can tell. There's another 17% who still have clearly have autism and but who are doing very well. And these are people more like people who are autism self-advocates who will say, I have autism. You, you would know when you meet them that they have autism, but they are really functioning independently. The sad thing is that even if the people who have these strong IQs, over half of them are really quite handicapped by their autism. So one of the things we wanted to do was to think about what is a good outcome, that, that what makes how could you define a reasonable life for a person with autism who it does not have a developmental disability beyond autism? And what we did was we used the World Health Organization sort of dis description of life, which is basically having some kind of social relationship, something to do during the day, 
and some ability to live independently. And these are all judgments which we can argue about because we could move these around. I'm not sure we were perfect at it in any way, shape or form. But you'll see these little tiles here. These are the number of people in our sample. For example, this is again with people of IQs over 70 who have a friendship, somebody that they care about, whom they see regularly, who is not paid to work with them and not related to them. And it's about half of the sample. We have people working, and this is even you know, better. About 60, 70% of people have an independent, regular job. This is not necessarily full-time, but they are paid um, and they are carrying this job out. And then less than half of them, and this is at age, this is predominantly at age 25, are living independently. Many people are still living with their parents and not necessarily very happy about it. Sometimes happy, sometimes really ready to get out of there. This may not be bad, so we have to be careful. Um, but what we were then able to do is put these together. And so you can see that about a third of the people, about 100 people now in this group that we are following, have a friend, are working, and living independently. It's again, the people in this orange, maybe people who are working, have friendships, are still living with their parents at age 25, which is not that unusual. But what is really upsetting here are people in the, in the purple and the pink. So about 50% of people are really very limited in things that we would say would make a good life. And I'm going to give you an example of one of our the, one of the people that has done really well. This is a boy that we met when he was two. I'm also going to show you the scores because I think another encouraging thing is that basically scores go up for kids, for kids who learn to talk. And we need to be really careful not to dismiss or underestimate kids on the basis of early scores. So all of these videos I'm showing you are from uh, toddler ADOSs or play DOSs. So that, So he is not very interested in looking at what she's pointing out. Um, and mom, his mom is sitting right there with him, but he does have his own ideas and he is gonna communicate them. And you'll see this NVIR is nonverbal ratio IQ of 69. So hundred is average, this is not average. Um, uh, this is quite below average and verbal IQ you can see is, is terrible. So here he is at age three. At age three, he was wearing hats. And I think you'll see for several years, he wore hats everywhere. Um, but you'll see the verbal IQ is coming up. The nonverbal IQ is still about the same. And here he is. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Okay, ready? little clip because I think this characterizes Dylan, which is he had his own ideas, but he always really was interested in making things happen. And whether those things were what we wanted him to do or not was a different story. So now you can see we've switched tests and his verbal IQ is up to 71. Nonverbal IQ is down a little bit, but it's partly because the test changed and he is in a hat again. <gasps> Girlfriend is gonna get you. Girlfriend is gonna get you. Girlfriend is gonna get you. He's gonna get you. He's gonna get you. No, 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 stop it, stop it, stop it. Stop it. I should stop it. Okay, done. So by 
by the time he was five, he actually had quite a lot of language, not at age level. And just for the purposes of time, I'm going to skip to here he is at age 25. So his scores, and this is, I mean, these are very, very high verbal IQ scores, but this is fairly typical of our sample of kids with IQs that were in the average range. By adulthood, they are at least average, if not above. And again, maybe that's because the parents that were willing to do this at two were smarter. Who, who knows? But here he is at 25. Honors. Oh, I mean, this, golf golf. Okay. She's golf? talking about golf. Oh, okay. Oh, that's right. You did tell me that you were probably going to do that later. Well, I don't know. I'm oh. talking the weather today. Uh, <laughs> ideal conditions. I don't think I will make it. Have you ever played at one of those golf courses? I have. I played this in high. I played Augusta and I played uh, Amherst. Um, I played Amherst in high school. Did not do particularly well. Augusta did it worse because it's just a very. It's a course that you see on television, and then you try to translate that into what you're doing in real life, and it just it, it's so much more challenging in person because okay. it's deceptively simple and pros find want to do. Okay. Well so he is at twenty five. Actually, I'll go ahead and show you 30, actually, because I've got it. So at 30, he owns his own condo. He has a job. He actually has his first serious girlfriend. Um, he knows the things that are hard for him. He is very organized and likes to organize things. And sometimes other people find this difficult. Um, but here you'll get a chance to see him. When you are afraid, what makes yourself feel better? Knowing that I will come home. Mm. <laughs> that's good. I'm not, I'm not scared of dying or anything right. like that because that's, that's going to be pretty quick. But mm. uh, afraid, normal day, yeah. I'll come home. I'm secure. Mm -hmm. There's comfort in the home. That's exactly Yeah, definitely. This is, you'll see the um, Django there because that's from a new instrument we've developed, which is um, just a little bit quicker than an ADOS. Um, and then I wanted to show you one other young woman who also has equally high scores in North Carolina, but who is, lives in a very small town outside of um, nowhere new or big city, does not have a lot of resources, and has really been stuck. Um, what makes you happy? Hmm. Makes me happy being with my family. Um, as far as me, um, going out and traveling, experiencing a new, different place, that's not really, you know, yeah, that, I mean, a lot of things are happy, but that in general makes me happy. Too. That makes me happy too. I think that's a good answer. Uh -huh. Any particular place that makes you extra happy? No, uh, anywhere, like a major city. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm not a big city person, but it's nice to go out there and uh, Yeah. So this is a young woman that really represents a trend that we are seeing, which is that she, she has so much ability, but it's just physically difficult. They don't have an extra car. She doesn't drive um, just for her to get, for example, into a place where she could have supported employment and get started. And what, what has happened is she is one of the cheeriest, happiest people we've ever known, um, having known her since she was a very small child. And she is getting more depressed. And it's not her fault. It's nobody's fault except our society for not giving her more options. So I'm going to switch gears and then I will come back to the question also of what about somebody who has more limited cognitive ability? Because we do believe that people, even if they can't be completely independent, can have a reasonable life. What, what, can, what can happen for them? And how would we know what a good outcome is? You know, many of the research, research in the past has defined outcome by jobs, um, uh, by very categorical ways. And somebody who has limited cognitive ability, so an IQ under 70, is very unlikely to be completely self-supporting, but they can do many, many things. When we look at our sample, Again, we defined here a friendship by having someone that the person gets to see regularly who is, again, not related to them and not paid to be with them. Um, and, but this doesn't have to be arranged by them. 
um, as, as an ordinary friendship would be. It could be living in a group home with another person that they really do like. It could be seeing somebody um, in an, a, a, a supported employment position or somebody that they look forward to seeing where it's reciprocal. So we can see about, this is true for about half, a little bit less than half. And this is something that anybody should be able to have. When we look at current activities, here we have an even bigger problem. Oh, this orange means doing basically nothing outside of your parents' home. Uh, and that is the case in this sample. And it includes about half the sample is in the Chicago metropolitan area, half in North Carolina. But this is very common for people to be at home. This doesn't mean that everything is terrible. Some people at home are doing OK. But we do worry about that just because it's so dependent then on their parents or whoever they live with. We have some people in supported employment, some people in voluntary positions or working in special centers. But again, the majority of people within this IQ range are not involved in anything. And then the other thing we decided was having enough daily living skills or self-help skills so that nobody has to dress you or bathe you. So it's really being able to dress yourself, take a shower, wash your hair, brush your teeth, so no one is touching you. Um, that isn't, you know, that isn't your choice. And this again, this should be possible for everybody in this, in this group, but it's not going on currently. So I think this gives us some goals to look for and aim for, for people that are maybe not going to be fully independent, but can be more independent, have more social contacts, and can do more for themselves. And when we put these together, again, you'll see what's different is we, than the group before, is we have, we have about a quarter of the people who are just getting nothing. We have maybe a sixth who, are, who meet all of these requirements. It doesn't mean life is perfect, but it does mean that they have some social contact beyond their family. They have some independence in daily living and that they're doing something. And what that doing really, I think, doesn't particularly matter as long as they are enjoying it. And we do feel like some getting out of the house, although during the pandemic, that's a whole other issue. So meet this little guy. We met at two. Saying bubbles. What? And again. So he at two, he didn't look that different than the other little boy who grew up to be this very functional adult. I'm going to jump again just because of time and show you this young man. And I want to make a particular point here. So this is what Brian, the young man, looked like when we met him at, at um, age 25. And he does have some part -time, a part-time job. Um, at a family friend's um, uh, business. Um, he has very low IQs. And part of that is just measuring IQs in a 25 year old who doesn't talk very much is really not a great proposition. We, when we saw him at 25, he would not look at our research assistants. And I'll just show you what okay. is going on here. Um, <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Yeah. All right. You might like this medicine. Let me have a costume party. Have some different masks here. I'm an elephant. Oh, yeah, 
You're an elephant. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just me. Um, where's Brian? Oh, there you are. <laughs> I'm an elephant. No, I'm just me. No, you're just you. So at this assessment, we knew he could talk, but he did not talk at all. He would not look at the research assistant. And we didn't know what was going on. And we were kind of worried, except that he is such a sweet personality. He was totally cooperative. He just didn't talk. But I, what I want you to see here is what he's like at 30. <laughs> he is kind of taking take your, your picture. picture. <laughs> that is a big should we smile together <laughs> it looks great <laughs> that's funny when do you go to work uh, uh, tomorrow you go to work tomorrow in the morning so in fact we realized that there wasn't anything particularly wrong with him. I think he was just embarrassed by this young woman who he, I don't know, either particularly liked or just was shy. And so he was a very shy young man with this, these young women coming into his house. And that hadn't happened at 19, it hadn't happened at 21, it didn't happen at 30, but it happened at 25. And we would have to be really careful not to overinterpret that to mean that he had some kind of marked regression, which his parents said he didn't have. Um, he can talk and he can do quite a lot, but people with autism have ordinary reactions just like anybody else. So one of the things that's happened, this just shows you the different times we saw the kids in this study. We saw them face to face at all these times. Um, and I'm gonna, um, but one of the things that's become clear is that the difference between autism and kids who were referred for autism, but we just said they didn't have it, or even our comparison group of kids who never had autism, is the differences are, sink, are decreasing. And it's more and more clear that autism does convey certain particular difficulties, a little bit more than other things, but it isn't totally unique. So here you can see, again, this is employment. And each bar, if you see, these are the people that when we met them at 25, we didn't even think they had autism anymore. And all but one of them had jobs. The one was in school in a graduate program. These are the people who have autism but are doing very well, also all employed. And then this is the rest of the sample of people with IQs over 70. And their average IQ is 100. So they're really average IQ. And you can see here about 48% are actually employed in real jobs and paid, but there's another 50% or close to 50% that are or more than 50%, sorry, that, that are not, who are really floundering. When we look at less people with IQs below 70, then there's this again shows you 67% of people do not have any kind of employment or activity during the day. And that's something where we just need to get going. I mean, I just heard that, um, Joe Biden's infrastructure bill has money for more residential places, and I hope they have also money for places for people to work. These are the people who never had ASD, and you can see that in their in the IQs are higher, they're more likely to work than this group, but not much. And remember, we pulled out of the more able people with autism, these two groups. So in fact, they're pretty much in the same boat. And then here, but what is possible clear that people who didn't have ASD who have lower IQs are getting more supported employment. So people are, for whatever reason, they're more likely to be involved in some kind of employment activity. So what, what I want you to see here again is that there are differences. These are the more able people with autism, people with autism with low IQ, and then our control group. But there is a lot of overlap. Um, and this is also true. It's interesting that for medication, if you look down at the bottom right, the people with 
autism and higher IQs have the least amount of medication. People with lower IQs have the most amount of medication, but many of the people who never got an autism diagnosis are also taking medicine. And there is now more overlap on ADOSs, less than ADIs, and that's the parent interview. And whether that's just because these parents We've been giving them the ADI for the, you know, off and on for the last 20 years, and they still describe their kids who use, you know, who have who had autism as worse than the never ASD. I, I don't know. So what, oh dear, there's a typer, but what is what are the specific effects of autism beyond a neuro other neurodevelopmental disorder? People with autism do have lower adaptive skills compared to what you'd expect. They do have fewer friendships and those friendships are less close, but it doesn't mean that they can't have friendships. I just talked about the medicine. They have, they're more likely to have ADHD symptoms, but there is no difference in employment, education, or daily activity. So one of the things to think about here is can we be more broad in terms of lobbying for better services for people with autism and for people with other neurodevelopmental disorders. It's also important to know that when you're trying to predict IQ, and here we're predicting nonverbal IQ at 19 from what a child's IQ was at two. For kids who had very, very low IQs, this is under 30, at two, they tended to stay in the same category. For kids who had IQs between 30 and 50, many of them actually went down. And again, this is probably more because a testing a, per, a nonverbal person at 19, we don't have very good measures. Um, and some stayed in the same range, which is this light green. For people from 50 to 70, there is huge, at age two, there is huge variability. And that's something that we need to be aware of when we're giving these tests and when we're giving people parents feedback. There are some kids who actually moved into the average range, some who moved into borderline, so over you know, 80, um, and then also some kids who went down. And the primary predictor of this was whether they learned to talk. This variability is also true for kids who got IQ scores in the 80s, 70s and 80s, but many of them went up. I mean, that's, that was the biggest clear trend. Um, but there also are kids who stay in the same range and go down. And again, the same thing for higher IQs, they're much more likely, about 70% stay really quite high. So we can count on that a little bit more, but not always. We need to be aware that things change. When we look at trajectories of language over time, we show sort of similar results, but not, but but they're very focused. If you look here at around what happens under six. So these, each one of these lines is a group of kids um, and this is their expressive language. And this is just based on Vineland expressive language score because um, that's the one score that it doesn't change, uh, the test doesn't change over time. But what we can see here is there are late bloomers. These kids who start very low and go up in the orange line and even this brown line here and here. So basically we have most autistic kids at two being behind in language. That is not everybody, but almost everybody. But there are a significant number of kids who do catch up. What's important is most of them start catching up between two and three, a few not until three and four, but by six, you see, you begin to see continued progress. All these lines are still going up, but it's linear. It's the line is straight. So we don't see these catch ups that occur in, in really younger kids. It doesn't mean no one will do it. Somebody may, but the majority of kids, if they're going to catch up and make enough progress in language to be fluent speakers, it really does need to happen before kids are five or six which is why we need to emphasize language and communication so much in early intervention. Another interesting thing we found was that the quality of interacting with kids, other kids as judged by teachers was a predictor of outcome. So this is just 
teachers' judgments when kids were nine and 14 of how connected they were from their, with their peers at school. And here we can see the kids who had the, the um, actually this was a rate, this is a rating of disconnection. So the higher score is worse. But you can see the kids who had the most positive outcome were rated by their teachers even beginning at nine as being more connected to their peers. These are kids who are cognitively able, IQs over 70, but um, didn't have as good an outcome as adults. And these are kids who are less cognitively able. Another feature here, which I haven't shown on the graph, is access to typical kids. And so here, access to typical kids also contributed to this, whether it was either being in, a, in some regular classes or it'd be having some kind of program where kids regularly saw other kids that were typically developing even if their classes were specialized. I included this just because we got this a couple of years ago. This is our first participant who got married, who sent us a wedding invitation. This is his idea, not ours. Um, he is very adamant that he still has autism, but he also is married, would love to have a family, is employed full time and actually doing quite well. I know these are harder to see and I think let's concentrate on the graph on the left bottom. But what I want you to see here is if we look at the blue line at the top, these are ADOS CSS scores. A CSS score is a score from one to 10 of how severe symptoms of autism are reflected in an ADOS. That's what it is. It's not over life, it's during the ADOS. And so 10 is the highest and one or zero, I don't think there are zeros, one is the lowest. So we see here the blue line, these are people, again, with IQs in the average range. Um, and this is, the, nor this is the, the group that is the most stable. And this is, again, about 60% of our sample. We also, though, had a significant group. And these are the people that we've said have very positive outcomes where the scores are going down, sorry. And what was surprising to us is we defined these groups by being low at 25 and being autistic at two, but we didn't know what would happen in the middle. We thought maybe they would bounce around or they would stay high and drop low, but they are very gently going down. And my point here is that changes are gradual. We can have miraculous opportunities. We can teach kids, um, you know, uh, priority skills like imitation. Um, they can have CBT and it dawns on them. They can reframe things. But basically, for the people that do the best, we see very gradual changes. And the reality is that diagnoses changed mostly in adulthood. Most of the people in our sample who moved out of autism looked autistic until they were in their late teens and now as adults. I think because we give adults more freedom, to be different ways, have found their niches and are looking better. The other interesting thing is down here, this little red is our control group and they have never looked autistic, but we have a, a small group. And this is again, about 20% who are moving into the autism range. And I don't know what that means. And I didn't even believe it when the research assistants told me about it that several of these people who I've known for years and said they do not have autism are beginning to look autistic. Whether that's because of social isolation or what's going on, we don't know. But I think the point is mostly autism is a stable diagnosis. These people aren't different people, but it also is, autism is the accumulation of experience and particular difficulties in learning and processing and strengths and the weight of all of those things shifts over time. This is when we do the same kind of graphing for people with lower IQs. And the main point of this, oh wait, no, this is not it, here we go. The main point of this is that basically with people with low IQs, people begin to look more the same. And maybe it's our measure. Maybe we have an adapted ADOS 
that we give to adults, maybe it just doesn't discriminate people. But I think the other point is that some of the things that are very marked earlier on, you know, for example, repetitive behaviors um, become more tied to the environment and less tied to the individual. And so they occur, this is here, these are repetitive behaviors. So they are less common in some people and more common in our non-autistic people. Um, and the, I think the point here is just thinking about this again, in terms of designing places to live, places to work, Another thing I wanted you to show, show you, and I know I'm hitting you with a lot of graphs. If you just look at the top one here, this shows how much can we predict the people who are doing the absolute best? Can we really predict who they will be? And you'll see here at age two, if we know they're male, where are they from? We can't predict really at all. If we know their score on the toddler ADOS, we really can't predict much either. If we know their IQ, we can predict this is up here about 70%. So it's, it's not perfect, but we can start predicting a lot, even at two. By five, we can predict who will be in that group. It's just scary, about 80%. And that doesn't change much across school years, um, but by nine. So my point is a lot of things have to happen early. So I want to come back to saying, why are developmental pathways and trajectories important? Well, predicting what is ahead. I would never try to predict what's going to happen for a two-year-old. I think, you know, unless the child has repeatedly scores that are under 30, and I was really sure that I saw him absolutely at his best, I think we don't know. We need to be careful. And for individuals, we don't know too. I mean, I know that I'm telling you really two contradictory things. I'm telling you that things can change, but I'm also telling you that generally when they change, they change incrementally. So we can start looking at where is somebody going? And that means we have to collect data. We have to have information about changes from year to year. I do think we can do a much better job of selecting goals for intervention. I mean, for example, in our data, that access to typical peers starting around school age really made a difference. Before that, it didn't. And maybe that's just because those opportunities weren't available, maybe because it's so confounded with can the child talk to other kids? And maybe, I mean, who, who knows? But we can say, look, by you know, middle elementary school, we need to make sure this is happening. And knowing when to intervene. I think that our key messages um, are one of the things we found, and I didn't show you a graph about this, is we have a measure of happiness that actually predicted outcome. And this measure of happiness was self-report from the people that could tell us themselves. Um, picking out adjectives that describe them and their lives that were both positive and negative. It also was questionnaires about well-being. How much do I like my life? And what am I looking forward to? When we put those all together um, from patient report, from the participants report for people who could speak for themselves and for parent report for people who could not, we did find that it did predict the number of those little tiles people had. It is related to what people are doing. We also found that for people with IQs over 70, it was related to internalizing disorders. It was also related to, are people depressed? Are they anxious? Are they getting treatment? What's happening? For people with IQs below 70, and remember their parents are filling out these forms, it was related to externalizing problems. Does this person have, diff is the, are they aggressive? Do they have difficulties that cause other people to feel like they have to manage their behavior? And in that case, things are less positive. Not a big surprise, but quite a different distribution. And I think we need to be aware of that. We need to do a better job of measuring how good someone's life is. I mean, we've tried to make a start here, but this is not an end. We also, need to know that ASD outcomes in objective ways are not that different. 
than for people referred for autism who never had it. So autism does not totally control or is not unique in the difficulties of finding jobs, finding places to live. Um, where it is different is people's ability to take care of themselves, which we could do a better job helping them. Friends, we could do a better job setting up those social relationships. Um, and, um, and ADHD symptoms, which can be treated or at least we can be aware of. We also can't deny or underestimate the importance of intellectual disability. I think that we do not want to categorize kids too young. We want to be careful. And I showed you all those shifting around of the IQ scores. But when, we, when a child gets to age nine, or sometimes even before, and we know that this child is not going to be fully independent, we need to be thinking, what activities can this child do that they like that they would look forward to. We need to be thinking systemically, where are they gonna live? And what can they do during the day? And how can we help systemic programs develop? Um, because this child is, cannot just be plopped into ordinary commerce. We also can't underestimate because changes are incremental, the importance of language, adaptive skills and social development. And we have a lot of really nice programs that are short-term programs like Jasper and Peers and Project Impact and all kinds of things that are great kickstarts. But then we have to think about what are we going to do then? Because again, the change has got to keep happening. And we could do a better job, I think, of measuring milestones that allow us to predict without saying these are causal but saying, look, it's good to know that this child is completely connected to his fourth grade class. He feels a part of it. He wants to be doing these things. Or this child is completely disconnected from going to school. Finally, I think, and I have not talked a lot about this, we need to remember the role of parents. I mean, in our study, the one treatment variable that comes out is whether parents got their child at between two and three into some kind of even low intensity activity, some kind of structured learning, and that the parents were involved. Not that the parents did it themselves necessarily, but that the parents um, knew what the children were doing and felt like they were learning as well. That made a difference, a difference between a very positive outcome and a less positive outcome in the kids who did not have intellectual disability. In our sample, all the kids who had significant intellectual disability got into services early. But for families with kids who were brighter, it was more of a debate of what do I do? And some families did less and some did more. Where we would like to get would be to be able to have like an individual plot. And this is just an example of here we have a child who is scoring at this point, for example, in the language. And then we see um, it, his verbal IQ is really steadily going up during preschool. So we're thinking, wow, this is great. What else do we need to look at? Well, I mean, here we're just doing a very simple model. Let's look at his access to typical peers. And can he be in a situation where he is connected with other kids as a, in later elementary school? Now, obviously we could have thousands of little spider plots off this. But the point here is, here is a child whose language is not coming along. So his verbal IQ is going down, but what else can we do for him? Can we give him opportunities to be around peers? And again, we could put millions of other things in here. And then these all predict the likelihood of a positive outcome based on even just those two factors. So just to sum up, We've identified a number of milestones. Again, they're not necessarily causal that, are pre that predict better outcomes in both of the groups, expressive language in the preschool years. I haven't talked about it a lot, but repetitive behaviors um, also, a lot of repetitive behaviors. Um, uh, kids who have a lot of repetitive behaviors have more problems. ADHD and hyperactivity, even judgments. I mean, we didn't make diagnoses of ADHD in our three-year-olds, but a judgment of hyperactivity actually slowed down, particularly 
the kids with higher IQs. So that is something to deal with and to think it's not might not go away and what are we gonna do about it? Adaptive skills really in our sample were not predictive until we started getting into school age. And part of that is probably they tell you more about the parents than they do about the kids. But starting in school age, kids who could get themselves completely dressed, you know, who had some kind of chore did better. Social skills, and I talked about the connectedness, and then academic achievement for kids with average IQs, academic achievement in high school and middle school actually did predict the chances of getting a job, even though people often don't have jobs related at all to whether they took algebra. But there's something about just being able to carry out academics um, that seemed to make a difference. And then this is like the long-term plot and just the fact that we're really talking about what, is, what skills does the child come into the world with? What does he need to learn to do? What can we do about it? So parent involvement and treatment. What are we aiming for? We're aiming for expressive language, especially in preschool kids. What are the things that go against us? You know, being behind, very active behavior, sensory needs, insistence on sameness. What do we want at school age? We want increased self-reliance and, and academic skills. We want social skills, more complex language, connectedness with peers. Um, and one of the things that are very positive outcome people also had starting in high school or college was part-time jobs. You know, and again, what causes what, we don't know, but the kids who had part-time jobs, even five hours a week, seem to do better. And then what do we want for adults? We don't, we can have different definitions of independence and dignity for different people with different skills, but we want people to be happy and we want them to feel like they're in an environment that they wanna be in, which involves community participation. We also want them to have something to do that they like to do. And that may be more of an emphasis, for example, on leisure skills or on daily living for people that are not gonna be employed outside the home. And then we also need to have freedom from other challenges for people that get very depressed or very anxious. We need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to treat those problems, which are real and which really do affect people. So this is just to bring this to a close. This is a tree that one of my assistants drew for us. And I think the point here is that whatever branch you're going up, this is one for people with minimal language. This is for late developing language. And this is for early language. There's still branches. You can still make good progress and it is gonna depend on a variety of different features. And here today, I've just emphasized a few, but like, what are you doing? Are you, you know, are you overactive or underactive? Um, how much are you doing for yourself given your level of ability and how much do you interact with peers? I think we also wanna remember that in research, it's very hard or we don't do it enough to acknowledge that strengths also make a difference. I mean, somebody who's got a great sense of humor or a, a wonderful attention to detail or is just the nicest kid on earth, does make a real difference. So we have autism defined by social communication and repetitive behaviors. We have common other problems like language disorders or intellectual disability, but we also have some of the most wonderful people on earth have autism and we need to recognize the good things that they have and how can we build on those. So, on that note, I'm thanking my colleagues. I'm not gonna list them all out, but Andrew Pickles and Jamie McCauley, um, and also all the families that have stuck with us, they have been amazingly patient, um, filling out forms and letting us barge into their house. We have learned so much from the people with autism and their families, and we are eternally grateful. And then I have had a staff who've done all this work um, and probably are better at getting, for example, the, the young men in our sample to talk to them than they would be talking to me as a grandmother. Um, and so they have also contributed. And um, it's also great to talk to you guys all. Our time in Chicago was some of the very best years 
of my life. So let me stop here and see if we want to take questions. Should I, um, Shannon, should I stop screen sharing? You can leave it up. That's fine. Uh, we did have someone who commented that they were so glad to see these children um, as adults in your videos, and um, they were happy to see that and really appreciative that you shared, um, shared those. We haven't had any other questions. Let me look in the chat. I have a question myself. I'm wondering if um, COVID um, has had a, a major impact in any of the trajectories um, thus far. You might not have met with any of the individuals, but just curious of um, if you determined any of um, influence there. We think so. I mean, we haven't, you know, we didn't set out to measure it, so we don't have like before and after. We've switched, you know, we typically go visit people every three to about every three years, and we got stopped in the middle of our visits. So we've been doing remote visits, which has been quite something. I think some of the people love them, and some of the people are really like, what on earth are you doing to me, <laughs> um, making me watch the screen? I, I do worry because I do think that, I mean, there are people who lost jobs, which is, you know, just like anyone else in the United States is really tough. Um, but I think it's especially hard on people with autism. There are people that are very socially isolated. So those people who didn't live with their families, you know, in some ways probably had a harder time because, I mean, particularly when, when people were hardly going out of their house, we had a couple of participants that we talked to regularly just from their little, you know, they had like one room or a, a studio um, just, just to try to stay in touch with them. Um, and I think that was very hard. And then I think the general, you know, anxiety level of our whole country, you know, with a combination of the pandemic, you know, the election, um, and, you know, the whole racial diversity and George Floyd and all that, was tough on some people. So I think it's been a hard time, but I think some of the people would love to stay home the rest of their lives <laughs> um, and you know just have people zoom into them and other people you know have really been hurt in a in a tough way. Sure. Thank you. All right, we got some questions coming in. Um, someone asked, can you speak to the effectiveness of the ADOS being implemented remotely or virtually? You can't do the ADOS remotely. So if people are doing the ADOS remotely, they shouldn't. You, you could certainly use ADOS questions, but you can't score it. It doesn't work. Um, so we have another version called the BOSA, B-O-S-A, which is available for free which is parents do with their children so they can take their masks off and you can video it and score it using an ADOS. You don't add it up like an ADOS, but it can give you a way to get a diagnosis. And at least here in California, the early intervention programs and stuff have, you, have taken it, insurance has taken it. So if you want that, you should email me and I'll give you the, I should know it, but I don't know the link to it. There's a, there's a tra training, it's all free. Um, and you need a few more toys that are in an ADOS kit, but typically you can do it. But it, you should not be doing ADOS as remotely. We, we still ask some of the ADOS questions remotely just because we are so wed to them. And you can do that, but you can't score it. Kind of along the same lines, can a mask be worn when given the ADOS? Is it valid? No, it's not. I mean, again, you're welcome to use the questions and the tasks, but you can't score, even if you're masked or the kid is masked, because there's a lot of reason to believe that. I mean, now kids are more used to masks, but that you're going to get different results by covering your own mouth and face, you know, um, or certainly in our hospital. You know, if we're in the hospital, we're decked out looking like we're something from outer space. And so you really, again, you can use the information, but you cannot score it. So if you need something to score, you should, I mean, you're definitely welcome to come look at the BOSA thing and it's free. 
Um, someone commented anecdotally, we've noticed significant growth and development in young adult populations once they leave public school programs in their early 20s. Their social skills in particular seem to soar. Does your data bear this um, out and do you have any thoughts on why this might be so? I think you must be in a good place <laughs> because for some people, they absolutely soar. I completely agree. And other people, they just sink. So it's so diverse, so diverse, and it depends on the opportunities. So whatever you're doing, you should keep doing it <laughs> because we need more of that. They can soar. I mean, when we look at, and again, this is kind of a strange way to divide it up, but when we look at our, our group and we routinely have research assistants and trainees go out and see them who don't know whether they were in the control group or where they, they had autism. You know, we have these people who don't look autistic anymore. Um, and that has mostly been changing as adults, not as kids, which I would never have guessed a million years. So keep up whatever you're doing. But unfortunately, it doesn't happen for everybody. Um, and it really depends on what the opportunities are for the young people um, and how well people set up those opportunities. Another person asked, what is your preferred method of screening and diagnosing adults with autism? I, I mean, we do the standard stuff and we just kludge it. So it's, but I wouldn't say we're, you know, we're happy with it. What we do is we first talk to the adult I mean, right now we're doing this remotely. Then we ask permission to talk to someone that they know who knew them as a child. So we then do, if we can, if you know, a, an ADI or a, some version of the equivalent of an ADI with their parents or with a sibling. Um, and if the adult wants to listen, this person who is being referred, that's fine too. Um, and we do a Vineland. And then we meet with them and we do a variety of different tasks. So we will do an ADOS. We will do something called the social emotional functioning interview, which is something that we used in research with Michael Rudder in the UK, which just has more questions about daily living um, and social perspectives. We will do some tasks that are sort of like theory of mind. And generally we will, we will try to do something with the person. So, if we don't have an IQ test, we might do it, but we're not so much worried about IQs. We just wanna see someone in action. We wanna see them doing something. With adults with fewer skills, we may do a TTAP, um, which, or at least parts of a TTAP, which can be very, very useful. Um, and then we again tend to meet with the adult um, if, they're, you know, if they're verbally fluent and then ask them, can you know, should we meet with other people? Who should we meet with and include them? But it's it's complicated and, and far from perfect. Uh, we've had a lot of comments um, on people remarking how grateful they are about all the work you've done um, and sharing your um, research. Um, they feel more confident in explaining things to um, others that they're working with, especially on cognitive functioning and how that integrates um, into things. Someone has asked, which assessments are best for girls? I mean, I, I think I, I don't, I do believe there are sex differences. So absolutely agree there are sex differences, but I think they're on a continuum like everything else and they interact with stuff. So. I, I mean, we do ADOSs for girls and, and are just careful to be aware that sometimes the girls are less, are, are different. And girls are different, I think, than boys. But again, the overlap is so much bigger than the separation. So I think you just need to be aware of it. I think there are, there are difficulties a little bit with some tests, like the SRS has different scores for girls than boys. And so it means that it's harder to get a good score, like an average score on the SRS, which I think is, I mean, is understandable in some ways, but it also means that girls come out worse on SRSs than you would, than something like an ADOS where we don't break down males and females. Um, I think doing, you know, adapted skills, 
surveys. I mean, we use the Vineland, but it's just because we've used it forever. So there are other ones as well. But I think being conscious of what you would expect, you know, and I think my big thing about girls is just they are a bit different. But think about what is the world like for them? And let's think about how can we get them opportunities that they feel comfortable with. And I feel like that's so much of a bigger problem than the diagnosis, because the diagnosis for everybody is so complicated with all the other things that might be going on, not going on, and then strengths. Great. Uh, someone asked, which ASD assessments are best for virtual settings? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think we're doing, I mean, we're more tied to the ADI and the, because we can do it remotely with the parents than we were before. I don't know that you always need it, but it's certainly when, you, when you're when you remote, you can get so much information. I think we also have set up this BOSA, which is basically, I mean, we we mail families a kit. I mean, it's, it's not huge. It's not like an ADOS kit. For those of you who know what the ADOS kit is like, it's got about I don't know, four or five toys in it. Um, and then you walk the family through on Zoom what you want them to do. And then they do it for 15 minutes while you video it or you watch it. So you can get some sense of what the child is like in a somewhat more natural circumstance, but with a little bit more of probes, not like an ADOS. So that's been really helpful. You know, there's some, some of the tests are available on Q Global. Um, you know, so you can do a PPVT, you can do a WISC. We don't use those tests that often because when we get some, well, the PPVT we can use, but the, the, the WISC, um, you know, when people are that smart to take the WISC, they probably had one, um, but there, those are available. The Ravens is available, um, you know, and then Vinelands. So you can definitely do a Vineland remotely. So at least that gives you a base. And then there are some kids, I mean, I've been seeing kids in my backyard um, and, you know, masked um, and then ask the parents to do things and I can sit six feet away. And so that's worked out fairly well, but I happen to just look, I've just bought a house that has a really nice backyard and a deck. Um, and so we can, we can do that with remote billing now. So that's something to think about. Um, if that's remotely possible for you. Great, thank you. Um, someone just added, um, if 19 to um, 22 is the age range for schizophrenia onset, can it be suggested it may not present until the late 20s given a delay in development in one who has ASD? I think anything is possible. <laughs> so I think that it, it would be a bit unusual, but there are people who develop schizophrenia in the late 20s. So it's not impossible. I would be careful. Mostly when there are delays in development, I mean, if it's, if it's a mild delay, so somebody who has an IQ of 70 or 80, that is generally associated with earlier onset, for example, not with autism, but just in general, earlier onset of schizophrenic symptoms. So it's, it's not going with what you'd expect, but I think you just have to use your judgment. I think it's so hard to tell you the truth. You know, we, in our sample, we do have one person who really does seem to have schizophrenia and autism, which is about right, because that's about a hundred, you know, out of a hundred people that are verbal enough so we would know what he's thinking. We have a couple of other people who have had psychotic episodes. And I think one of the things that has happened in the general psych psychopathology literature is recognizing there are all kinds of people have psychotic episodes, particularly around traumatic events, but all kinds of people have psychotic episodes who do not have schizophrenia. You know, they have a psychotic episode in response to something. So that's another thing to, to think about. And my experience is once the people get into inpatient units, they get, you know, 40 different diagnoses. Everyone, you know, these are mostly trainees all trying to figure out what's going on. And you just need to wait till they get back out <laughs> and figure out what's going to happen next. 
Um, but it isn't, I don't think it's the same in most cases as real schizophrenia. Great, thank you. It looks like um, many people are asking if um, we could share this your slides because they wanted to look more in depth at the graphs that you shared. That is fine. I have to take the pictures off, um, sure. but I, I can definitely get you the slides and you're welcome to all the graphs that you want. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, and lots of people are asking about the BOSA. I do have um, those um, links to okay, the you. video and to gather more information because I've shared those with our network um, as well as um, to utilize them. So that looks like all the questions that we have. All right. Well, thank you very much, you guys. I wish I could see you. And um, I will, Shannon, I will get you the slides minus pictures as soon as possible. <laughs> that I appreciate greatly. Thank you so much. Oh, one more question came in. Does the BOSA require written permission from you? It does. I mean, it's we had to beg WPS not to charge for it. So you have to sign something that you, it's, it's supposed to be done by somebody who knows how to give an ADOS. You don't have to be research reliable, but you just should not pick this up. Um, so you have to, you, it, you have to sign something that says you will use this ethically and that you are experienced with the ADOS and then we file it away. Um, but we did have to do that because, I mean, thank goodness WPS let us do this, you know, because normally, you know, they're a business. Um, and so we have to charge, you know, they charge for things, but they did let us put this together. So that's a, that's true. That's great. Yeah, that's all in the link to of, of um, how to acquire it as well. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Lord. We greatly appreciate you.